provide for his daily needs. Tent making would be especially suitable to him during the missionary travels. So in other words, he wasn't exempt. He was not exempt from working, even though he was uh, on his missionary duties and he could have uh, he could have uh, taken for other people and people did help him. Don't get me wrong, he got help. But there were times where he could have taken advantage, but he didn't. He had a trade and he used his trade to provide for his daily needs. Mm -hmm. Am I getting that right, uh, yes. Pastor Norm? Mm -hmm. Would you have anything to say concerning it? Now I want to look at his religion. Unlike many young men in every age, Paul's early life was not characterized by disinterest and hardness against religion. He was no atheist, nor even just a casual religious person. Mm -hmm. Rather, he was wrapped up in the religion of what? Judaism. Uh -huh. Now let's look here. It says here, it says, he himself testified that he profited, advanced, he profited and he advanced in the Jewish religion above many his people. In my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers, of the tradition, look at here, he was more zealous of the tradition of his fathers. Paul's religious zeal received much encouragement from his home, from his father, from his father. Paul also later became, which Paul also later became. His training under Daniel would, un under, would only intensify his zeal in Judaism. Paul was diligent, even though he was going about going about it the wrong way in what he was doing. Yes. He was very diligent. He was diligent about what he was doing. He was focused and he was at work. And yeah, he was very, very committed in what he was doing. Now if Paul, but he but he shed that commitment and he was that same person. But well, that's, now you think about it, if we take the commitment that we had in the world when we were doing, when we were doing things that we should not have been doing, yeah, I can say it that way, <laughs> then if we take that same commitment, mm -hmm. and I can say even 80% of that commitment, yes. for which we should take all of it, and try to even add to it because now we're doing it for the Lord. And if we take that same commitment with that same focus that Paul had and as believers now, and then we come together like in the book of Acts, the second chapter, where they came together and they were so committed, mm -hmm. those people got saved Yes. And they were so, then they became so committed and they had one focus. Mm -hmm. It wasn't no big person, no little person, no in-between person. Even though, understand me, we had different functions. We have the pastor, we have deacons, we have ministers, we have, we, you know, we have different functions in the church. And they had different, they had to have the different functions there, but they were committed for one goal. And then because they were committed, look what God did. God said he added, the Bible says God added to the church daily. And then no one, no one there around him went without. No one was with lack. Because there was no, they didn't see no big person, no little person. They saw that. They, God called this person to this position, and then God has called me to this position, and they were comfortable where they were at because they were focused on one thing, 
Christ Jesus himself and what he's called us to do, and that's to build the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, it says, uh, I want to read again, his, his religious zeal received much encouragement from his home, for his father was a Pharisee, which Paul also later became. His training under Gabriel would only intensify his seal because of his surrounding. And then his Judaism. Look at Judaism, the word Judaism. What is Judaism? The faith, the faith laws, traditions, and teaching of the Jewish religion. Judaism is based on worshiping the one true God. Circumcision as a sign of being one of God's chosen, one of God's circumcision as being one of God's chosen people. They had to. These were some of the things of Pastor Norman was that the law required at the time, right? You had to be circumcised on the what eighth day. Yeah. You know, uh, you couldn't do certain things on a certain day. These are on the Sabbath. So they had a lot of rules in there, mm -hmm. and but the one thing that they were missing, they had no compassion. Amen. Rules mm -hmm. with no compassion. Yes. Rules with no grace and mercy. Uh -huh. Everything was cut and dry. Yes. So they had nothing to move their heart the way God wanted them to move. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Paul was so zealous towards. But look at here. But when he was transformed, when God changed his life on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. look how that zeal turned. And then now, that's why he said, all these things that I have gained, I now count as dawn. Because why did he count them as dawn? He said to know him in the power. Because all of our answers, everything we're looking for, everything we want, we're trying to get. I'm not able to, 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 to love the right way. I'm not able to have the type of compassion I need to have. But how can I get that? Can I get it through the law? No. Law doesn't teach those things right there. There's nothing wrong with the law. But the law doesn't teach those things. But God taught us grace and mercy. Uh -huh. God taught us how to forgive, yeah. how to love one another. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. But he that loveth not, knoweth not God, because God is love. Listen to that. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, because God is love. That's what Paul had first. See, he had the traditional things, the religious things, and he knew religion, but he didn't know God. Because if he did, he wouldn't later on say that now, because I know him, I have a connection with him, an encounter with him, and I will say this, it is impossible to get in the presence of the Holy God the way Paul did, or the way some of us say we did, and change not take place. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that you have had an encounter with a holy God and walk away the same person. Amen. It don't work like that. Amen. You know, I know who my God is because when you're in the presence of God, change take place. When you're getting the presence of God, if you don't have peace mm -hmm. in the midst of your circumstances, what you're going through, if you get in the presence of God, my Bible says, in the presence of God, in His presence, is fullness of joy. So if you don't have joy in your life, get in the presence of God. Spend time with Him, and joy will come. If you have unforgiveness, get in the presence of God. And that's why Paul was telling us, all these things, it's okay, nothing's wrong with them, and I'm just paraphrasing, there's nothing wrong with them. But the most important thing is to know God, mm -hmm. not to know about Him, yeah. and to know rules, and coming, oh, this is the way we do it in our church. And you're not open to change. 
Oh, this is the way we've done it in our house. My parents have done it this way. My uncle's always done it this way. Well, that's okay they've done it this way, but could it have been the wrong way? Mm -hmm. See, could it be possible? Let's see what God says about his way, because Colossians, Colossians 2 and 3, it tells me, it says, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is in. So everything we're looking for, all of our answers, is tied up in Christ Jesus. And in Hebrews, I think, uh, 10 and 11 or 10 and 12, I, I'm not sure, I know it's in the 10th chapter, the Lord says, he said, I come, I come, in the Bible of a book to do thy will, O God. And he's given us this. And in this book is all the treasures of life. And this book is my success. In this book, there's my education. In this book, there's my peace. In this book, there's my joy. In this book, this book helps me to be able to forgive this person when my self, I can't do it on my own. I want to do it, but I can't do it because of what this person has done. But this, it'll help me out every time. And you'll get the victory every time. And so that's what the, uh, uh, the uh, Judaism, I don't knock it down or nothing like that, but it had a lot of rules. And that's what we don't want. We don't want rules. We don't want rules with one another. When people come into church, what builds the church is building a relationship. Yes. And if we don't have a relationship, if we're not striving to build a relationship with one another, to respect one another, I might not agree with you on everything. We have no one's going to agree on everything. But we have to respect one another. Uh -huh. That's one thing that we do all one another. And then the scriptures tell us, it says, beloved, let us. So it doesn't, it's not singular. It, it says, let us love one another. And so if God says, now I didn't put it in the scripture. So if God says, Pastor Norman, let us love one another. I want you to be able to build this church up this way. And so, if God tells you to do it in His Word, then He doesn't do like I would do. I would say, hey, I want you to go out here and build this uh, in my backyard. Now, well, how would I, I don't know how to build it? Figure it out. You know, go get directions or something. You figure it out. But God is the builder of everything. Mm -hmm. And so when God tells you to build it this way, I want you to build your, I want you to build the church up this way. He gives you the means to be able to do it. He gives you everything that we need in order to do what he's asking us to do. So he just don't tell us to do it. He gives us the, and then when we use the tools, the one thing about God's tools, when we use them and we use them properly, yes. it'll never fail. Mm -hmm. It will never fail because he said, my word, when it go forth, it will not return back to me void, but it will accomplish that which I send it to accomplish. That's why when Paul went into covenant relationship and he got on the mission field, nothing could stop him. Prison couldn't stop him. See, prison tried to stop him. They tried to stop him by way of beating him. They tried to stop him by way of shipwreck. They tried to stop him, the enemy tried to stop him by way of allowing him to be bitten by something that should have killed him just like that, you know. And none of these things could have, could have, could stop him even though there were obstacles in his way. Yes. But they couldn't stop him. Why couldn't they stop him? Because he became about his father's business. And the Bible says when we're about our father's business, He'll take care of us, and he'll never fail us. Let's look at uh, number B: the brutality of the persecutor. The terrible brutality of Paul and his persecuting of the Christians is seldom properly recognized. Some, however, such as Matthew Henry, who rightly described Paul as a Fire fierce persecutor do seem to grasp something of Paul's terrible evil. He called him uh, Matthew Henry.
<laughs> he called me what? Fiery, furious, persecutor. Man, that was some strong words. In examining these many passages of scripture of Paul's persecuting work, we cannot help but be astounded and shocked at Paul's cruelty. It is hard to believe that this indeed was the man we revert, we reverend as the greatest apostle of them all. His record was so bloody and so barbaric that one finds it very hard to believe what we what he reads in these passages about Paul, even though reading is from the infallible and inherent word of God. Isn't that something? And only God can, I don't know if anyone else can, if you do, then uh, write us to the church or you know, let us know. But I don't know of anyone that could take a life. But I do know that each and every one of us today, all of our hearers today, know of someone that have been so bad at one time that we looked at their life and said, that boy is never going to change, or that girl is never going to change, or we looked at it and we thought that there was just no hope for that individual. And that time, Paul was also looked at because you think of the things that he was doing. And so that's why, despite of what things look like, God tells us, and this should help us to even understand even more. He tells us, he says, walk by faith and not by sight. And then he tells us, he says, call those things as not, mm -hmm. as though they were. Mm -hmm. Walk by faith yes. and not by sight. Yes. And call those things as not, as though they were. And then listen to this part. That when we do that, we're doing a good thing. We're doing something good. And then, where is the scripture? It says, faint not in well-doing. Oh. Because what we're doing is well-doing. And trusting God. And doing those things. So he said, now faint not in well-doing. Because if you faint not, you shall reap the benefit. So that's some of the mothers and some of my mothers. And I even think of my mother. Someone told me something concerning my mother. And my mother been dead for about 30 years now, over 30 years now. But they said the prayers of your mother is still working for you today. Uh -huh. All the times they prayed. And when I look back on my life and what I was back then, it was because we sing a song. There is a song. If I could sing it, I would sing it, but I can't sing it, folks. Uh, and it says, someone pray for me. Someone pray for me. And when we continue to pray, despite what things look like, and we pray, and we don't think, we don't pray, not like I'm praying, for this person, for God to work in their life. And then, I'll pray that way today and then tomorrow, I'll look at them and i say, oh, ain't nothing happening. See, ain't nothing. No. We continue to trust God. I mean, continuous prayer, in spite of how the worst the situation gets, God just told us to do one thing. He said, pray, and he said, walk by faith and not by sight. Because when we pray, we can't do it, the work. When we're praying, when we're praying, we're trusting God to do what man's not able to do. And so we put it in his hand. When we're saying, God, I'm putting this, which I can't do, I can't accomplish, I can't change the situation. So I'm going to put this situation, and I'm trusting you to take care of what no one else on earth can take care of. And I'm going to continue to trust you 
no matter what things look like, because I'm trusting you knowing that I can't put a time limit on you. I can't do that. He told Moses, I mean Abraham. Abraham doesn't have a son. But Abraham was 75 years old. And then I think it was 25 years later when he came back. And the angel said, the angel of the Lord said, you're going to have a son this time next year. Lord, have you considered my hands? Abraham, is there anything too hard for me? So be it. Nothing's too hard for God. So when we're in a situation and we're looking at some uh, individual life, we're praying for, we're praying for a situation, whatever it may be, when you're praying about it and you're believing God for it, then when doubt tries to creep in, then what you have to do, you have to ask yourself the one question, is there anything too hard for my God? Uh -huh. Because my Bible says, he that cometh to God must first believe that God is, and that God is the rewarder, the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. He's the rewarder of the ones that don't give up. They continue to trust Him despite of what things look like. And now. <coughs> We talked about the brutality and the destroying. Man, he did some damage. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Uh -huh. The word translated havoc only appears this this uh, this once in the New Testament. It means to thoroughly destroy, to revenge, to devastate. A graphic illustration of the meaning of the word is found in the Septuagint, where the word is used in Psalms 8 and 13 to describe the destruction of a vineyard by a wild boar. Hmm. The destroying action of Paul, of Paul, are also spoken of in Acts 9.21 Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name? Talking about Paul. See, he was changed. Is this the same person you're talking about that saved them? That I remember him when he was out here Still, he was out there doing all of this. He's been, he's been, and all of a sudden, is this Acts nine and twenty one? Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name? He was doing things that shouldn't be no making a mockery of the name of the Lord, ain't even believing in the name of the Lord. And all of a sudden, God has stepped in this life and changed his life. Is this the same person? I know it's the same person, but he don't talk the same. I know it's the same person. He don't walk the same way. He's not hanging around the same people. Everything about him, except the way he looked, is different. Mm -hmm. He has it, but he has the same name. Yes. His name is still Bob mm -hmm. McGee. Yes. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. But is that the same person? I know it's the same person, but everything that's coming out of his mouth is so different than everything that was coming out before. Because yes. I remember what he used to be. Uh -huh. That's why uh, 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 the song says, he said, when I look back on my life, yes. all that God has done for me, yes. my soul cries out, hallelujah, because I'm so grateful for what God has done, how he's able to step into a situation and bring something so beautiful out of something so ugly. Uh -huh. So once again, Acts 9 and 21, is not this he that destroyed them which called on the man. We know we all know some he's. Galatians 1 and 13, I persecuted the church yes. of God uh -huh. and wasted it. Yes. 
And Galatians 1 and 23 proceeded in faith. Yes. Which once he destroyed. Yes. He proceeded in faith, which at one time he was trying to destroy. Yes. His mission at one time was to destroy. But look at his mission now. Yes. It's to build up mm -hmm. the body of Christ. The brutality of Paul in intruding Saul entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to where to prove yes. Acts 8 and 3. Mm -hmm. In his violent hatred of believers, yes. man, I'm looking at this. It says in his this man was tunnel focus. It says in his violent hatred of believers, Paul intruded that that is he literally forced himself into home after home to find Christians to cruelly drive them off to prison. Uh -huh. Not just take them by the hand and leave them. Mm -hmm. He was going to their homes. They were just dragging people that have children mothers these are Christians that haven't done anything mm -hmm. this one person that we read about today yes the brutal the brutalness of Paul's persecution persecution efforts would stop at no one's door hardness he broke up many homes by impulse which produced untold sorrow and harm as a result. It said it produced untold sorrow and harm as a result. Some things that we don't get the opportunity to read about. That's how brutal this man was. And so now, I, I, the scripture doesn't say this. This is just me leaning on my own understanding. Mm -hmm. Because I kind of compare it with some of the things that myself, some of the decisions that I've made in the past, or some that maybe you have even made in the past. But the Bible says, we're sin about, grace about, much more. It says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. But at the same time, we still have to suffer some of the sins of our past decisions. Yes. But God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Mm -hmm. So you think about, and I just think, man, all the things that Paul did to some of the people, and he said, the thorn that was in his flesh, and whatever it was, it was tormenting this man. It was tormenting him in such a way and that he appealed to God and he said he appealed to God on three different occasions. Whatever it was to take it away. And I'm just reading this thinking that could that be? I don't know. Uh, but I know in some of my lives, in my life, there were some of the things that really kind of still bothers me. But God gives me the grace to get through. And I said, Lord, take it away because the Bible says whatsoever man sowed that shall be reaped. You sowed that seed. You're going to have to live with some of the decisions that you have made, but God's grace is sufficient. So understand this just because you're praying and He doesn't take, He doesn't just take this away from you. It could be because, like myself, I pray, Lord, take this memory or take this away from me, but it hasn't been taken away because. This is the seed that I sowed. And he said, I can't take it away because I've already told you in, in, in my word. Whatsoever you sow it, that's what you reap. Now this is your harvest. This is your reminder. But I give you the grace mm -hmm. to get through whatever it is. Yes. I'll give you the strength. Because I want you to focus on my, on, on being about my business. Uh -huh. But that doesn't mean because now that you say, and now that I'm 
doing good and I'm not doing what I was doing before, uh -huh. I don't have to suffer behind some of the decisions that I made in the past. Uh -huh. Some of us have to walk some of these decisions out. And some of your decisions that you have made in your life, you're going to have to walk it out. Yes. But it's better to walk it out with God's grace uh -huh. than to try to walk it out with your own grace. Because we don't have no grace. Yeah. Because if you try to walk it out on your own, uh -huh. you're going to be tormented. Yes. But if God walking with you, uh -huh. He's going to give you the grace that you need. Yes. Even though I know it, I feel it, He gives you the grace that you need to get through it. Because nothing, absolutely there's nothing too hard for my God. Let's look at his imprisoning now. And I think we're right at three minutes. I can read this and then we'll stop here. Then we'll start next week on the threatening. Uh, it says, committed them to prison. Mm -hmm. Acts 8 and 3. Yes. See also mm -hmm. Acts 22 and 4, 22 yes. and 19, and 26 and 10. At least four times in scriptures we are told plainly that Paul put followers of Jesus Christ in prison. Mm -hmm. Criminals need to be put in prison, not those who follow Jesus Christ. However, Paul's action belonged in prison. The believer's actions did not. Mm -hmm. Paul was a criminal in his persecuting conduct not the believers in their faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul was just like many cruel nations in every age who cannot tolerate Christians. Put them in prison. Was his philosophy hard to believe that the greatest apostle of them all was at one time zealously and violently putting many Christians in prison. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. Just like mm -hmm. it's not too hard to believe uh -huh. God can take a life like that yes. and change it <coughs> for His glory. Amen. Father, I just thank you for this day, for this lesson. I thank you and I pray that it didn't fall on deaf ears, Heavenly Father. I pray that every listener today got something out of it, oh God. And so I pray for every one of them in the sound of my voice, oh God. I call them blessed and highly favored, Heavenly Father. And I pray whatever they need is, oh God, that you need according to your good and perfect will, that you need every one of their needs, Father God, without anything that's in our acting, according to your good and perfect will, that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our King, and our Savior. And that is all finished by saying, Amen.